We are um, in the Kuzari on page uh, 110 and 111 is where we left off. And we're just going to do a little bit of a review today and uh, try to clarify where we are in the text and where we're going. Uh, over the last uh, maybe two or three weeks that we had the, the, the class, uh, we were talking about Rabbi Yehuda Halevi's conception of chosenness, what makes the Jewish people special. And um, for Rabbi Yehuda Halevi, it's something very clearly innate, inherent, within the Jewish people. We, we described it in genetic terms, although Rabbi Yehuda Halevi doesn't use that word genetics. I mean, it was a, that's, a, that's a modern word. But he says that there's something within the, the innards of the Jew that is passed down from parent to child. And we, it seemed like, someone had, someone had asked for clarification, it seems like it was a patrilineal uh, descent of this gene that was passed down from father to son, starting with Adam HaRishon, starting with the very first man. And Adam HaRishon possessed some kind of superhuman trait, which we, we were able to at least infer from Rabbi Yehuda HaLevi that it really, the only... Um, the only quality that makes this person superhuman, whereas everyone else is normal, everyone else is human, um, is the power of prophecy. Uh, but that's not originally the way it was. Originally, this superhuman quality manifested itself in even in physical ways as well. In that people were very, very strong physically, People lived unusually long lives if they possessed this genetic quality that was passed down from father to child. And it only was within one child out of an, a, an, entire, uh, uh, an entire family of children. So a husband and a wife would have a large family. They would have, like the Torah says, Vayolid Banimu Vanot. As you look in the, in the end of Parshas Bereshis and Parshas Noach, it says, they begat, they begat, they begat, and they had many, many children. But then it identifies one, one son from the family. And that for Rabbi Yudha Levi, the, the reason for identifying that one son is to tell you that that was the one in the family who possessed that superhuman gene, and it was passed down to his future descendants, but only one of those future descendants. And then this went from Adam down to Noah, so Noah was the inheritor, was the heir of this superhuman gene. He in turn passed down to one of his three sons, and the only son that received it was Shem, and Shem in turn passed it to one of his descendants, until, et cetera, et cetera, until it finally got to Avraham Avinu. And when it got to Avraham Avinu, he passed it down to only one of his children, even though he had two children, he had Yishmael and he had Yitzchak, he passed it only down to Yitzchak. Yitzchak passed down the superhuman gene to only one of his children, even though he had two sons, Yaakov and Esau, it was passed down to, to only Yaakov. And then something changed with Yaakov Avinu, in that instead of it being passed down to only one of Yaakov's children, it was passed down to all 12 of his sons. And this thus began a new era, explains Rabbi Yehuda HaLevi, where instead of there being only one person in a generation who possessed the superhuman gene, it was diffused into an entire family of people, and then it became permanently embedded within the genetic uh, DNA of the entire family or house of Israel. Okay? And that's... Uh, and that's the way Rabbi Yehuda Halevi explains what's going on over here. Um, there was just a, a recent scholarly article that came out. There's a lot of discussion in the scholarly community about what Rabbi Yehuda Halevi's influences are. And because we know that, uh, that Rabbi Yehuda Halevi liked the Rambam, and liked the Ibn Ezra, and like a number of other medievalists, 
they were very much influenced by certain ideas that were circulating in their time. And certainly eugenics was a very much a part of medieval thought about, uh, in, in the philosophical community, certainly you could not, everyone was zoiche to be a philosopher. You had to have certain uh, innate natural qualities in order to reach a superlative intellect. Even so, you had to have nature and you had to have nurture. But there, th th this, this recent article went into great detail to try and explain uh, the Islamic influences that Rabbi Huda Levi was, uh, was influenced by. A lot of this is speculative, of course, but certainly this whole idea of being, uh, having some innate special quality within an individual or within a people is something that is not unique to, uh, to Rabbi Huda Levi's thought. You can find it in other places as well uh, uh, during this historical time period. The one thing that Rabbi Yehuda Levi leaves ambiguous, actually there are two things that he leaves ambiguous, and the two things that are ambiguous is um, that there seems to have been some kind of evolution of this superhuman gene as history progresses generationally. When it starts with Adam and the first ten generations from Adam to Noah, <coughs> the manifestation of this gene is very, very powerful. It doesn't just manifest itself within a person's spiritual essence, but it manifests itself physically as well, to the point where Rabbi Huda Halevi says that the only people who lived exceptionally long lives that are recorded by the Torah were only those individuals who inherited that gene. So when you find that, for example, Mitu Shalach lived 969 years, it's not because that was the average lifespan of everyone that was living before the Flood, but rather it was because he was unique in his generation and that he had inherited this special kind of gene. So only the Tushalach of his generation lived over 900 years. Everyone else lived 90 years, 80 years, however long they lived, according to Rabbi Yehuda Levi. This is disputed by the Ramban, by the way. The Ramban says that everyone was living 800, 900 years in the times before the Flood. And, and uh, so that's one mystery, is how this changed. It's, it seems to have evolved in a, so that by the time we get to Avram, Yitzchak, and Yaakov, they're living more normative lifespans. Certainly, you know, lifespans become shorter and shorter. Avram lives 170-something or 180-something years. The Avos are living very long lives compared to what certainly twice as long as people live today. But progressively, lifespans become shorter and shorter and shorter. And it seems from Rabbi Yehuda Halevi that it's sort of the, um, <coughs> the physical manifestation of this superhuman uh, quality within the Jewish people tends to wane over the course of the generations. And he doesn't explain why that is. I guess you have to explain that it's because of just... Uh, you know, the general principle of nitkatnu hadorot, that the generations diminish over the course of time, and whatever characteristic was manifest, um, even on the physical plane, diminishes over the course of time, um, and, uh, and it could be just because of uh, genetics, that because every man is marrying a woman who's sort of normal and doesn't have that superhuman quality, and as a result, it diminishes over the course of time. But one thing that remains within the Jewish people for all of posterity is the ability to prophesy. This is the, this is the point that Rabbi Huda Levi is trying to convey, is that the superhuman gene that exists within the 12 sons of Jacob, make, what makes them special is that they have the koach hanivuah. They can have a certain kind of conjunctive experience with Hashem receive communication from him and communicate back. The second really big mystery, and this is the big, the big question throughout this discussion, is what is the role of human initiative in chosenness? And that's the big question of the day. Let me just unpack that question. Uh, what, what made Avraham Avinu chosen? How odd of God to choose the Jews. Why did God choose the Jews? Did God choose 
Avraham because he was special, because of his righteousness, because he made free will decisions on his own to reject idolatry and evil and to adhere to monotheism and, and goodness? Or did God choose Avraham because he was the heir of some genetic material that had been passed down to him by his ancestors? And if indeed Hashem chose Avraham because he was the genetic heir and it had nothing to do with his own behavior, so what makes the Jewish people special? Why did God? How odd it is that God, there is what, what makes the Jewish people chosen? We seem to have done it using the system that Rabbi Yehuda Halevi describes. We seem to have contributed nothing to our own greatness. It seems that it was predestined from the times of Adam that there would be one family of man that would be allotted with this genetic greatness to have the ability to prophesy. And it's a very, very passive kind of of description of how we become, how we are formed into the chosen people. It doesn't seem, there doesn't seem to be any kind of initiative that any of the Avos displayed in order to make them deserving of this. And this seems to be not only difficult for us to fathom just from a logical standpoint, but when we look at scripture, when we look at the Psukim in the Parshios and Sefer Bereshis, it seems that what makes Abraham want what makes Hashem want to choose Avraham is his righteousness. And Hashem tells Avraham, you know, uh, you know, I, I, I've chosen you and, and you're righteous. Actually, it's very interesting, the Maharal makes a very interesting observation. When we look at the beginning of Parsha Noach, we note that it starts off, it says, Eile toldos Noach, Noach ish tzadik tamim haya bedoros av esa elokim hisalech Noach. The Torah first starts off the parsha of Noach by describing the character of Noach, that he was a righteous man in his generation. He walked with God, and it doesn't say that by Abraham Avinu. If you notice, at the beginning of Parsha Lech Lecha, when it describes the life of Abraham. It just says, Vayomer Hashem el Avram, Lech lecha me'artzecha u'mimaladetecha u'mibes avicha el ha'aretz asher ar'eka. It doesn't say that, uh, you know, uh, no, uh, Avram ish tzadik tamim haya b'dorotav et ha'elokim italech Avram. Never, it doesn't describe the character of Avram Avinu. And this lends credence, says the Maharal, to the to the position that, of what we're reading here, is that the selection of Avram Avinu was not predicated on his righteousness. God did not choose Avraham because he was a good man. He chose Avraham because God needed to choose Avraham. That's one of those mysteries. It's one of those just strange things. Now, you have to appreciate what what is the driving force behind the Maharal of Prague saying what he's saying? Here you have a great rabbi in the 16th century in Europe, in a very, very Christian world, who uh, is facing a lot of, the Jewish community is facing a lot of persecution because of this belief in supersessionism, that God has replaced the Christian for the Jew that the Christians are the new chosen people because once the Jews rejected Christ their chosenness was stripped from them and given to another people who had would accept upon themselves the Son of God and as a result the Maharal has to explain that our chosenness <coughs> is not predicated on the decisions that we make in life it's a direct polemical response to the Christian doctrine of supersessionism. He's, he needs to explain to us, he needs to clarify that God didn't choose us because we, were, we made good choices. God chose us because he chose us. 
And therefore, anyone who suggests that we could have that chosenness removed because of bad choices that we made simply doesn't understand what it means to be the chosen people. So that's the benefit of a theology that Rabbi Huda Halevi is putting forth, is that our chosenness is irrevocable because it is one of the, myster the mysteries of God. And therefore, you can't say, well, because we didn't do something, we lose it. We can't lose it. It's God's decision, and it's a permanent decision. And it's not predicated on our behavior. But the thing that you lose is, it just doesn't make any sense. You know, that you want somebody to make sense to you. And it's, it is a certain satisfaction that we get out of being chosen because we were the good guys. Right? Yeah. There's a certain sense of satisfaction in the sense that we think that, well, it was in Chosavos, you know, the merits of our forefathers because of their greatness, and that we inherited certain inherent traits of greatness from our ancestors because of their great righteousness that was passed down to us. And, but no, but, but is that why God chose us? So I don't think they're mutually exclusive. You know, we, uh, yeah, the, the Rabbi Huda Levi still believes in the concept of zuchus avos, of the merits of our ancestors, that they were truly great and righteous people. But that's not what our chosenness is predicated upon. So the two are two totally different things. We do have a right to invoke the righteousness of our ancestors and learn from them and inherit their behavior and their traits. But at the same time, there's a theology that states that's not why God chose us, though. He chose us because he chose us, because we were the heirs of this kind of, uh, of specialness. Yeah? But then do you still have to postulate that after he was chosen, he then, because of his chosenness, became great, as you said yourself, it says in the Pesukim themselves. No. no, I don't even have to in invoke uh, Midrashim, that he was... Right. Yeah, there seems to be a combination of both. I don't know what comes first. Is it, you know, is it the, ch it's the chicken or the egg? You know, that's, that's the whole issue. There's, I mentioned last time, I think I may have mentioned, there's a Rav Tolidano who has a, common, a, a contemporary Rav Shlomo Tolidano has a sefer called Sipuru Machshava, where he has a, a commentary on Sefer Kuzari. And he comes up with a theory, where I don't know where he gets it from. But, it, you know, it's a theory that at some point in the evolution of the passing of this gene that goes down from generation to generation, at some point, the gene became so weakened that you only inherited it if you deserved it to inherit it. If you became, if you were righteous. <coughs> and so therefore, by the time it comes to Avram Avinu, Avram can only sort of activate the gene if he's righteous. If in the generations before, you inherited it unconditionally, but then afterwards, at some point in the evolution of the generations, you could only sort of activate the gene if your behavior sort of turned it on. Sort of like if you have, let's say, you know, I might have the gene to become a great basketball player because I might have, you know, you know, great uh, muscle tone and all that stuff, but if I sit and eat bonbons in front of the TV all day, I'm never going to make it to the NBA. I've got to exercise, you know. So it could be a combination of both things, you know. Yeah. Um, Rabbi, so you just kind of uh, mentioned, you said Rav Talidano also followed the Shita that the, <coughs> we were heir to genetic material. Like, I don't know enough about, is this specific to Halevi and he brought this genetic piece up and then we, you know, there's other scholars or and Rabbanim and Parshanim that carried on uh, this, this, this line is, of thinking? This is unique to Halevi. <laughs> I, don't, I am not aware, and I could be mistaken, but I'm not aware of anyone who comes before Rabbi Yehuda Halevi who puts it forth in this fashion. I don't find, I don't think you'll find this explicit in Midrash at all. Um, Rabbi? Yes? You mentioned the prophecy was one of the, um, the signs that, like, um, well, my question is, like, prophecy was not exclusive to Jews back then either. Are you sure about that? I think so. I think I heard about the non-Jews that were a prophet. Maybe well, you may be right. So Rabbi Yehuda Halevi is going to have to deal with that because he's very clear that prophecy can only be accomplished by the Jewish people. Now, you happen to raise a good point, and that is 
we do find that there were non-Jews who prophesied. And um, we, we've talked a little bit about this in the past. We're going to revisit it later on. Um, uh, but this is one of the big debates between the Rambam and Halevi. The Rambam is of the opinion that uh, non-Jews can achieve prophecy because he doesn't, he rejects this whole ontological genetic theory of Rabbi Yehuda Halevi. He, the Rambam does not believe <coughs> that chosenness is innate, creates an innate difference between Jews and non-Jews. The Rambam, chosenness is a mantle of responsibility and privilege, no more and no less. You know, just because I was born in a mansion with a silver spoon in my mouth doesn't mean that I'm inherently different or genetically different. It just means I'm more privileged. And that's the way the Rambam seems to view what it means to be the chosen people. So we'll see. Um, so anyway, um, um, there's also another sort of side point that's attached to this, and that is that um, uh, Rav Cook quotes, uh, in one of his writings, he quotes from uh, the Akedas Yitzchak, who's a late medievalist, Rabbi Yitzchak Arma, who says that there's a difference between chosenness of an individual and chosenness of a nation. And this, of course, is very dear to Rav Cook because he, he, he very much likes to write about the national, or the nationalism, or the national features or identity of the Jewish people. And he writes that there's a certain irrevocability within the national identity of Klal Yisrael. That our national identity can never be revoked or superseded and taken away from us. But individuals can break free of their destiny through free will choices. So if a person has a certain individual destiny, then you may have a destiny to become someone great, but because of decisions that you make in your life, uh, you decide to not uh, achieve your destiny. People, people do that all the time. People are born to achieve greatness and then they just squander it. But the Jewish people's national identity can never be revoked. Our, our national identity for chosenness is a quality that we can never break free from. And um, that also, again, is sort of part of the polemic against supersessionism. Yeah? Um, so, like you're saying right now, you mentioned before, our chosenness isn't something that can be taken away from us as a nation. Right. So, how do we explain the time when we sinned in the desert and Hashem wanted to destroy us, and then Moshe had to beg, um, beg him to keep us around? Was he going have you have you been reading? Did you did you look ahead? <laughs> 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 Take a look at paragraph ninety six, everybody. Great segue. <laughs> paragraph ninety six on page one eleven. The Kuzari said, I grant you that they inherited their greatness from Adam, and that Adam was the most perfect of all creatures, and that your nation was worthy of achieving more greatness than anyone else in the world. But still, how could there be any remnant of greatness after the sin of the golden calf? And we'll continue, Mir Shem, next week.